Welcome everybody. Welcome to the last, the 10th of our special series of webinars to chime in with Churches Count on Nature. All week, churches around the country have been going out and taking biological records of the plants and the trees and the insects and the birds that they find in their churchyard. And all week, we've been doing our special themed webinar program about different aspects of land and nature. And you are all very welcome to the last of the 10. We're finishing with the big picture for the UK and globally and how that big picture relates to local action. So you're going to get an overview of the twin crises that we face, climate change and biodiversity loss, and the linked solutions that exist, which can become from becoming nature positive. I think Pete's going to tell us a little bit about the two international COPs uh, coming up this year, biodiversity and climate, and how they link to national responses and local responses. I always begin with the trailer of upcoming attractions. I can't tell you about any more Churches Count on Nature webinars because today's the last one, but we do, we are returning to our common ground of net zero carbon. Uh, so the middle of June session on the new faculty rules, middle of September, we're doing a session on how central procurement can help parishes locally through procurement of things like energy audits and solar panels and heating. And then in October, I've got two, um, um, two dates for a session on direct electric heating solutions, which are particularly good for churches which are used irregularly. In terms of the housekeeping today, we'll be using the Q&A for the questions rather than the chat. So please do find the Q&A. That's where to type your questions for Pete. Uh, and you can see everyone else's questions and to click the thumbs up symbol if there's one there that hits the spot for you. Um, after today, I'll be sending you, um, if this is OK with you, Pete, if you can let me have them, I'll be sending around the slides and any links from the chat. Uh, and we're sharing all of the recordings through our webinar page on our website. So you are in very safe and expert hands for the next hour. You'll be hearing from what the splendidly titled Canon Dr. Pete Brotherton. Uh, Pete is the Director of Science and Climate Change at Natural England, but he also really knows what it's like for those of us in the church trying to tackle these issues because he is the Diocesan Environment Officer for Peterborough Diocese and he's also a lay canon of Peterborough Cathedral. So today he brings that combination of church knowledge and his knowledge from Natural England to really help us make the connections. Let me stop sharing my screen and Pete if you're happy to share your slides and take us away. Thank you. Let me see if this works hopefully you can see that perfect. absolutely perfect lovely and um thank you all for giving up the end of your week i'm, I'm between you and gin and tonics or wine or whatever whatever you'd be going to on a friday evening i'm keenly aware of that and very grateful to you for joining so yeah i'm, I'm gonna go i'm gonna go big actually i'm gonna gonna try and wrap up the week by um providing um some of the providing that global perspective and then hopefully grounding it in things that we can do that will change and and, and really make a difference so i'm gonna um go through some of the latest evidence on biodiversity um loss and climate change talk about the, some of the global and uk responses in particular with regard to what happened at COP26 and what might happen at COP15, should it finally happen? This is the COP26 being the climate change event that happened in Glasgow last year and COP15 as the um, Convention on Biological, Bi Biological Di Diversity Equivalent, which, um, which is due to happen in China. Uh, I'm gonna consider what it means to become nature positive in the UK and how we would go about doing it and um, touch on roles for the church as I go through. So I hope that this is of interest. So, so where are we with um, the state of nature now? There's so much information out there. You, you can almost, um, uh, um, you know, pick and choose the the evidence to um, to show you know the various scales of losses at various different um, uh, across different ecosystems and um, and so on. Um, globally, 
uh, we know that there was around 10 million hectares per year lost during the decade from 2010 to 2020. Um, that hasn't slowed despite recent commitments. So 11.1 .1 million hectares were lost in 2021, including 3.7 million hectares of um, primary forest. And one of the trends that we are seeing is that wildfires are becoming an increasing cause of those losses. Around the world, um, wetlands have suffered very severely. Probably the, the ecosystem um, that has changed most over the last um, 50 years or so are our wetland systems. And of course, that matters because that's our drinking water and that's, that's the future irrigation supplies for, um, for our agriculture. Wetlands have declined by around 35% um, between 1970 and 2015 and declines are ongoing. Most of our rivers are now um, interrupted in some way, only um, less than a quarter now flow uninterrupted from their source down to the sea. And all of that change adds up to um, a huge amount of species being threatened by extinction. And Global Biodiversity Outlook 5 and the most recent global assessment estimated over 1 million species are now threatened um, by global extinction. In the UK, we started early in, in terms of the habitat losses that have occurred. And those past habitat losses now mean that we're amongst the most nature depleted nations on earth. In other words, um, when we look at what would have been there in a pre-industrial context, we've got fewer habitats and um, fewer intact ecosystems. Uh, that of course has consequences and those consequences are ongoing and felt today. So 40% of species today are in decline across across the UK, over 40%, it's 43% to be exact. Um, 40 million fewer birds now fly in our skies over the past, 50, uh, if we look back over 50 years, and 25% of mammals are threatened by extinction if we apply international criteria in a UK context. Uh, turning to climate change, um, if we look across different sources of greenhouse gases. So each of these colors represent um, a different source of gas and a different type of gas. Um, two, two, of those column, two of those bars, the blue and the amber, um, represent um, carbon dioxide um, from fossil fuel and uh, land use respectively. But if we look across those ranges, we can see that actually um, it's increasing. All of these are increasing. Um, despite promises being made across the world. And if we look at the very latest data um, from uh, the Mauna Loa Observatory in, in Hawaii, um, just going right up as far as last year, we're still seeing global increases in carbon dioxide. The, the blip and the change that I think a lot of the world um, hoped would happen on the back of um, COVID, where there was a potential to reset, potential to restart economies in a different way simply hasn't materialized. We're now emitting more carbon dioxide, we're chopping down more forests and so on um, than ever. Um, that's the global picture. That, that I commend this website to you. It's quite fun. It's Ber Berkeley Earth, where um, what this um, group have done in America is to, is to analyze how much change is already happening in, in different countries of the world. So you could go in, do your drop down list and say, okay, well, the world may have warmed by 1.3 degrees. Um, where are we now in, in my country? The UK um, has already warmed by one and a half degrees. We're flattered, of course, by, our, um, by being surrounded by water. So if, if we even look just as, as close as France, um, we see that um, France is already at two degrees. And, um, and other countries, Austria, if you go slightly inland in, into continental Europe, are already at about two and a half degrees. Over three billion people around the world um, are estimated to live in hotspots of high vulnerability to climate change. People are already being profoundly affected by the climate change um, that, is, that is coming. And recent estimates now suggest that um, there's nearly a 50% chance that we will exceed one and a half degrees this decade. Those two relationships between nature and climate are, are intricately linked. Um, ecosystems, 
comprise a very large component of global greenhouse of the global greenhouse gas balance. Um, most of our carbon is locked up in um, in our peat, in our trees, and so on. And degradation of ecosystems is a major cause of climate change. Uh, about 35% of historical uh, carbon dioxide emissions come from land use change, primarily the loss of forests and wetlands and so on. Um, and currently that's, that's gone, come down to about 11%. Um, over half of our emissions are absorbed by land and sea. Um, and what we're seeing is that our ecosystems and biodiversity are profoundly vulnerable to the climate change that's already happening. And that's, that's not just temperature, often it's the more extreme events uh, that, are, that are having the most severe impacts on our ecosystems, droughts, fires, floods, and sea level rise, and so on. Um, consequently, protection and restoration of our ecosystems is a key element of climate change adaptation and mitigation strategies around the world, or at least it should be. Um, the, the experts tell us that that's exactly what's needed. Um, Nature-based solutions, as they're called, could lock up about 20% of global um, carbon dioxide emissions or equivalents each year, 10 gigatons each year. Uh, um, but we're only beginning to scratch the surface in terms of realizing that potential. Nature is also key to helping us adapt. Um, Recently, um, this fantastic analysis, uh, um, the IPCC has produced um, the, the international, the intergovernmental panel, panel on climate change. The IPCC has recently produced six assessment reports. This is the one of the, um, the second working group on impacts, adaptation and vulnerability. This is one of their results, um, which indicates that up to 14% of species face a very high risk of global extinction uh, by um, um, if, if we, if we um, warm by one and a half degrees, um, that increases to around 29% um, if, if um, we warm by three degrees. And increasingly, that's the kind of change that's looking likely. Already, one and a half degrees, to, um, if we're to be successful at getting to one and a half degrees, to, it requires us not just to get to net zero, but to remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. So we're already looking at serious risks of overshoot. Um, nature's, nature offers us crucial services to survive that warming world that we, we're now committed to. Um, pollination, um, coastal protection, um, recreation, foods, health, water, filtration, clean air, climate regulation, and so on. All of those become increasingly hard for nature to deliver as the resilience of those ecosystems become undermined, as the numbers of species that are present in those ecosystems um, reduces as a result of climate change. And the, there are real risks of this um, real downward spiral of species being lost from ecosystems, making them less able to do what we need them to do, um, making them less able to help us respond to climate change, making climate change worse, which in turn makes the ecosystems weaker and so on. So real risks of, of feedback loops there. Also real risks of um, carbon cycle feed, feedback loops. So terrestrial ecosystems um, contain, that lock up over four times the amount of carbon that's currently in the atmosphere. Um, a similar, similarly, they lock up over four times broadly the amount of carbon that we estimate to be available in untapped fossil fuel reserves. So losing our terrestrial ecosystem-based carbon, this is in peatlands often and in our trees, is, is, um, um, is, 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 is risks huge damage and, and huge um, feedback loops into the atmosphere. And, the, and that's made more likely by the increases in wildfires, um, tree disease, peatlands drying out, um, thawing permafrost and so on, which again feed back into um, higher carbon emissions, creating real risks of, of tipping points. Um, I mean, if, since it's a Friday, I, I personally, I, I worry that we've already passed some tipping points. We just haven't realized it yet. I think um, the, 
the, the changes that we're seeing with wildfires, the changes that we're seeing with permafrost in particular, are profoundly worrying. Um, so what's the world solution? Well, two key events are, um, two, two, two key um, um, uh, conventions um, are, are fundamental to how the world will respond to these global challenges, and they are massive global challenges. Um, the Climate Change Convention, which happens every year, the most recent being in, in Glasgow, and the um, Convention on Biological Diversity. That happens every other year, which is why we're only at COP15. Both of these started off at the same place. Their genesis was in the Rio summit um, uh, back in 1991. And the, um, but th that's why we at COP26 already and only at COP15. So I'm gonna say a little bit about each of these. Um, the UK presidency um, stated a number of goals for COP26. The first was to um, uh, try and make steps to keep one and a half degrees within reach and secure global net zero by mid-century. And there are a number of measures seen as really key for achieving that, notably accelerating the fa phase out of coal, um, curtailing deforestation, um, speeding up switch to um, electric vehicles and encouraging investments in renewables. Oil, not, not on the agenda then. Um, interesting thinking about the geopolitical world that we live in now, whether or not um, oil um, will be in COP27 when that happens in, in Egypt uh, in November, hopefully. Uh, second was around adapting to protect communities and natural habitats. Um, both through protecting and restoring ecosystems um, and building a more resilient nature through embedding natural solutions um, as part of our adaptation responses. So building defenses, warning systems, a more resilient infrastructure and agriculture to avoid losses of homes, livelihoods and, and lives. Uh, Mobilising finance was the third key area. Um, this is always the biggie. It's, it's, it's the thing that these conventions seem to um, fail or succeed on is, is rich countries that have done the most to um, cause climate change, putting their, and have, and have grown economically substantially on the back of it, putting their hands in their pockets to actually fund a different course of action amongst those um, southern global south countries, more developing nations who have yet to um, uh, to, to develop in the way that we have, and a, a strong sense from those nations that, okay, if that's the route we want them to choose, then we need to compensate them for that and, and certainly, certainly pay for the actions that they take. Uh, and a sense that international finance must play their part better um, uh, as, we, as we move towards um, uh, a global net zero. It's, it's in their interest. These, these companies want to be around in 50 and uh, 100 years. They want to have staff that still want to work for them and so on. And uh, there's trillions and trillions of private sector uh, um, that, that um, will be needed to um, secure global net zero and, and, and they need to play their part. Um, then more um, almost um, housekeeping areas, um, um, finalizing the Paris rule book, that's, that's the rules that relate to um, uh, what counts towards carbon budgets and so on, and um, accelerating action across societies. So how do we do? Well, here's, here's my sense of broadly where we got to. There, there were some good commitments at the time. I, 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 the slide is... Um, a few months old now. <laughs> I'm, I'm wondering whether I've been too generous, if I'm if I'm honest, in terms of um, of those assessments. But certainly, there were some real commitments around um, phasing out coal, or at least, um, if not phase it. I think the final term was phasing down the use of coal. Um, big commitments around curtailing deforestation, um, for example. Um, a, a growing realization around um, the role of local communities, um, certainly from a nature perspective, um, the, the estimates are that, at least for terrestrial biodiversity, um, uh, local indigenous people um, uh, have about 80% of biodiversity on their land. So a really key role for them in, in how we act to um, conserve nature. 
and how and the actions that might be taken when it comes to protecting forests and so on, if, if that's part of the climate change package. Um, money didn't really talk. We didn't get to the 100 billion. There were some increases in, in, um, in the amount of money that did come forward, the UK and EU amongst those that announced new financial packages. Sadly, in the context of Ukraine, we're seeing some backsliding of those promises. The UK hasn't, hasn't done that yet. Um, I hope it won't. Um, but certainly there are a number of countries that are now saying, well, um, we, we, we better postpone that commitment, um, even though we're still not at the um, $100 billion that are estimated as needed each year to support climate finance. There, there was, however, some good recognition from big financial institutions um, of the need to do more real progress with science-based targets and, um, and financial disclosures and so on, um, and some progress on finalising that um, Paris rulebook. One of the exciting, I was lucky enough to be at COP, and one of the really exciting um, things that felt different there was this alignment of climate and nature. Uh, there was a nature day, um, 6th of November was meant to be nature day, and I, I you know, went along thinking, well, that's when I'd hear about nature, that's when I was doing a talk and um, organising some seminars, and the rest of it was all going to be big hardcore oil and so on. Actually, that wasn't the case. Nature was everywhere. And this, this, this mantra, climate is nature, nature is climate, is something we put forward um, as Natural England with our partners in other countries. And it was really being picked up as, as something that we, we needed to cement. If you care about climate, you need to care about nature because of the intricate links between them. Um, what about COP15? Well, <laughs> with a COP15, I've called this. COP15 um, um, is now over, over, well, two years late. It was meant to happen in 2020. It was postponed for, for COVID. It was meant to then happen in um, uh, October 2021. It began. Uh, there was an opening ceremony um, in Kunming in China. Um, but then it, it, it it was, it was always understood as this was going to be a ceremonial opening. The Chinese would receive the presidency from Egypt, who had it before, and, and then the, the COP would finally happen, possibly in March, maybe in May this year. It still hasn't happened. Um, uh, the, 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 um, the Chinese are now saying um, we don't we will hold a COP. They've, they've stopped giving firm dates. I think they've recognised that it's making them look bad by um, announcing dates and then postponing all the time. And they've, I think the phrase they've recently used is to say, we will hold a COP when the situation has normalised, um, by which, of course, they mean um, uh, COVID. Um, they, they have a zero tolerance approach to COVID. And I think they've realised that holding a, a massive global conference of 20,000 plus people coming from around the world is incompatible with that policy with the COVID rates and distribution the way they are. So I think a real challenge there, uh, growing calls for it to be moved from China, but um, a um, concern that the Chinese have alluded to a financial package as being part of the Kunming um, settlement, the Kunming statement, um, an outcome. And um, Kunming, by the way, sorry, is, is the city that this is due to be held in in, in southern China. Uh, and I think a lot of the global south states are worried that if it moves from China, that money may not come. Um, nonetheless, there's a lot of work going on behind the scenes to try and produce what it was is increasingly inappropriately named the global the post 2020 global biodiversity framework. Um, it's expected to include a, a range of really key measures, um, perhaps most prominently replacement of the um, the 10 year target set back in 2010, the so called HE targets. Sorry, I've spelled that wrong. It should be AI CHI targets. Um, agreed in, in, um, in Nagoya in Japan, um, including a flagship 30 by 30 um, protection of land and sea target. But the, these targets will span various aspects of, of biodiversity in, um, across um, ecosystems. Uh, there's keen hope on a global financial package, and this links to my point around um, the Kunming um, Declaration and what 
um, may or may not come on the back of this. Um, um, growing recognition of the role of indigenous people and local communities in securing nature and um, the recent drafts that I've seen now, now has them writ large throughout. So rather than it being a sub-target somewhere to say, oh, by the way, we must remember these people. Um, actually, the, that role of indigenous people and local communities is, is now writ large throughout the, the, the evolving text for this new post-2020 global biodiversity framework, which um, you know, is, is, is a real positive. And something that is a, um, has, has long been um, part of the challenge. So the, the, the CBD has is, is, is never been this conventional biological diversity has never just been about um, protection of nature. It's very much around um, the sustainable use of nature and its and the fair and equitable sharing of benefits. And this challenge around how we properly share the benefits from nature, um, which which could span everything from genetic resources and the, their use in um, pharmacology, um, through to um, the um, the benefit of leaving forest um, uh, standing instead of cutting it down. So how do we capture those benefits in ways that benefit the, the local countries and uh, the local communities whose biodiversity that is? That, that's the big challenge um, um, for these um, global resources and um, work going on to try and resolve that. But uh, again, lots of concerns that COP15 overdue, we need this, we need change at global level um, and, and still no sign. Um, fortunately, the world hasn't just been sitting on its hands and we are seeing um, some change. And so the lead, um, the, um, a group of over, um, well, this says 92 nations, it, it's, it's higher than that now, have signed this leader's pledge for nature. Um, and um, there's a high am ambition coalition, the Global um, Ocean Alliance and so on, are, are all trying to forge um, a better way forward here and make commitments and deliver things in, in parallel to waiting for um, a new um, uh, global agreement and this post-2020 global um, framework. The UK is really prominent in these activities. There's a good story for us to tell there. Um, it's, a, it's a key member of this high ambition coalition. It helped to write this Leaders Pledge for Nature, which, um, um, which really puts nature far more prominently in public discourse. Um, and if we're coming closer to home now, um, think if we think about um, where the UK is going, um, the, the UK was one of the first countries to adopt a legally binding target to get to net zero and has been ramping up the ante on that. Um, so we now have a, a binding target to reduce our carbon emissions by 78% by 2035 compared to 1990 levels as a milestone towards that 2050 net zero commitment. And most recently, as part of our new Environment Act, we have a target um, to halt the decline of species abundance by 2030, which is hugely ambitious. D DEFRA, um, the Department of Environment, Food and Rural Affairs, um, which is broadly responsible, at least for the nature part of this, and has, a, has um, the lead role on adaptation across government, now calls this their compass. These two targets are their compass um, through which um, all their activities are going to be viewed. So these, these are hugely influential and, um, and it's kind of show the value in governments committing to do the right thing, even though they don't always know how to get there. And I think there's an echo there in what the church is committed to uh, with its 2030 commitment. It is the right thing to do. Um, we need to work hard to get there. Uh, we're still working that out, but, um, but crikey, we need to try. And that's, that's essentially what the government is committing to do now. Um, more than 20 years of, um, of science, and um, probably even 30 years of science, has, has told us that reversing biodiversity loss is a really hard thing to do. It requires transformational action. Um, and and th this most recent analysis just echoes that point. 
Um, it, th th this is not something that we do by protecting places. It's about changing society. And, um, and I, I want to spend a few minutes now talking about some work that um, I was involved with alongside colleagues from across nature agencies like Natural England from across the UK um, called Nature Positive 2030. There's the link there to these reports. There are two forms of them. One of them's a, a nice little glossy summary report, but the evidence report I think is really rich. It's not that long, it's 90 pages. And, um, and I think is a really useful resource where what we tried to do was to say, yes, it's really hard to become, to transform our relationship with nature. It's really hard to become nature positive, but here's how. And, and here are some of the examples across the UK and beyond, which you could scale up to get there. Um, one of my favorite bits of the report was something I didn't write. It was, it was written, it's the foreword written by um, four young people from across the UK who, um, who gave a really challenging, if you read nothing else, read the foreword of the report. I really commend it to you where the, it's quite hard hitting and it's basically speaking to the future and, um, and saying, you know, we're the generation that's been handed the ecological crisis and we're the generation that will have to live with the decisions you make today. Um, you're the ones in power, get on and do something for us. And a really good call to action, I think, from those young people. Uh, the headline messages from the, um, the report um, is that you know, nature loss harms human health and well-being and undermines our economy. It matters. Um, recovering nature is everybody's business. It's, it's not something that rests with uh, NGOs or a few bits of government. It's really important that we go high nature and low carbon, tackling the twin crises of biodiversity loss and climate change together. We either tackle both of them or we tackle neither. Um, and it's not too late to become nature positive by 2030 in the UK, provided we act now. In, in doing so, um, we set out some fairly important caveats or, or reflections around how, how we could um, approach, uh, how we need to approach this. So firstly, that um, we need to move away from short term renting of small patches for nature. Um, to establishing far larger spaces for nature and nature networks where, where species can thrive if we're going to restore ecosystems in, in the UK. We've got far too many fragmented patches of habitats where um, even if they're protected areas, many of the species are declining even in those places and we need to reverse that pattern. But nature conservation isn't about going back to a point in the past. It's about building a nature rich future with restored ecosystems that are more resilient to climate change and other pressures. Um, we conclude that becoming nature positive by 2030 is not an end point, it's, it's just turning the curve, but it's an essential milestone on, on the path to nature, nature recovery. So this 2030 target that the government has um, isn't the end, it's the start. And as we make space for nature in the UK, we mustn't take space from nature in other countries. We also need to reduce our global footprint. Um, the, we analyze 12 policy delivery areas and identify 40 action, 42 actions that are needed and across those actions highlight good practice happening somewhere in the UK that's ready to be scaled up. And they, they fall into these three broad categories, one around mainstreaming nature, um, um, including aligning action for climate change and, and nature recovery, um, pro protecting and restoring nature and transitioning to more sustainable land and sea use. One of the encouraging things is that we know that if we get the conditions right, nature can recover really quickly. And it doesn't just have to be at scale, but here are some examples of scale. So the Great Fen is a project not far from where I live. I saw Nigel was on the call as well, um, cl quite close to where Nigel from Ely lives as well, where um, nearly 4,000 hectares of, of um, fenland habitat is being, re is being restored. And we're seeing really great examples of recovery um, in, in that area. One of the classic uh, landscape scale recovery projects is, is at, um, at an estate um, down in um, East Sussex at NEP, uh, where um, despite never having had the emperor 
a purple emperor butterfly that you um, see there. Within 10 years, they had the second largest population. They now have the largest population of, of this um, really beautiful butterfly and it's spreading. And there are some fantastic examples of, of nature that's just come back to what was effectively a rather devastated agricultural site. In Lime Bay, um, we're seeing really rapid recovery of, of um, nature after removing um, bottom trawling uh, fishing pressures. Um, when thinking about becoming nature positive, and maybe I should have put this up earlier, what, what I'm meaning there is that you know, this means recover, reversing the current decline. So we, we come off this downward trajectory uh, as shown by the start of the green curve so that we um, um, species and the ecosystems in which they live are, are recovering. Um, and what, what we think about are both the actions that we know that we can deliver today that could halt the loss and bring us back um, so that species are beginning to recover, but also uh, we've identified a whole range of tr more transformative changes that are needed to um, really get to uh, thriving nature by 2050 or, or at some point in the future. So um, the, the kind of land management, land use actions will only get us part of the way. Ultimately, we have to reverse, we have to change our relationship with nature. And I'm not gonna go through this in lots of detail. Um, if, if you're interested, do look at the report. Um, but um, just to say, there, there are some really exciting initiatives that are already underway that are, are beginning to create change. So um, there's now, um, a requirement for built developments, or there will soon be um, a legal requirement for built developments to deliver a net gain for biodiversity um, if they're above a certain size, which is most of them, to be honest. We're seeing um, uh, a real move to establishing nature networks on land and at sea, and um, uh, at local level, local nature recovery strategies will be a key part of the planning system in the future. The government has set aside £750 million um, as, as part of a Nature for Climate Fund, which is mostly dedicated on, to planting trees and restoring peat, and we're seeing increasing action on water pollution. So th this range of things can support that immediate place, and, and thinking about the role of the church, well, I think there are a number of immediate um, steps. Um, one is we need to bring together climate change and, and biodiversity loss in our thinking and our strategies. So many churches now, most dioceses now have um, committed to the net zero commitment. Let's think about how reversing biodiversity loss, potentially becoming nature positive, would fit with those strategies. We have a lot of land. Um, uh, church commissioners own about 100,000 hectares, I think of uh, 100,000 acres of, of, of land themselves, but um, close to many churches, churchyards, are or could be many of the UK's best urban biodiversity sites. Um, these are places that we can make better, keep them messy in some places, um, bring people in, get them counting nature as, as hopefully many are this week. And ensuring our Glebe and Church Commission land is managed in positive ways and making that link to nature networks that are being established across the country um, and thinking about the role of future agri-environment in, in in, on that land. We'll be, um, we have a real role as well in leading communities, um, that convening power of the church is fantastic. And, and let's use that to get people out in nature talking about it and, and making local change happen. And we heard from Andy, Andy Lester this, this afternoon, earlier on today with, with um, um, about some fantastic examples of, of what's happening in, in urban settings in particular with the church at the front of that change. But we need to go far further than some of these um, proximate changes will, 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 will do for us. Um, we, need to, um, we need truly transformative action. Um, top amongst the list because of the impact globally is around transforming agricultural subsidies. So globally over $500 million, half a trillion dollars is spent on agri-environment agri subsidies harmful to nature. Um, about 15% of that amount is spent on, that, on subsidies that are positive um, for nature. Uh, and so we need to change that. We need to change the rules that, we've, um, that we currently 
um, used to allocate that sort of funding to farm it, farmers and other landowners um, in a way that still allows us to grow enough food. Um, and, and I think the status quo isn't an option. We know that globally over 20, 20, even though food production has increased around the world, that's coming at a real cost. Um, soils are being degraded. The, um, the way in which we're applying fertilizers and so on with the huge agricultural runoff issues and so on. Um, soils are simply washing away around the world. So 23% of land is already less productive and desertification is a, is a massive problem around the world. So carrying on as we are now, and um, using subsidies the way we currently use them is, is a poor outcome when it comes to food in the, in the medium to long term. In the UK, um, the estimate is that if we use 20% of our least productive land for nature, that would be over 4 million hectares of land. Um, that, that, that would only lead to a drop of about 3% in calories produced. Um, and there are huge improvements that we could make in terms of efficiencies of the food supply. We throw away 10 million tonnes of food each year. The, 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 the carbon um, emissions alone from the food that we throw away are something um, like you know, um, um, 20 million tonnes, I think it is, of, of carbon emitted as a result of um, the food that we throw away. Uh, we need to think about using nature-based solutions, a green and blue infrastructure, to deliver out integrated outcomes for health, well-being, nature, and our economy around our towns and cities and, and in our countryside. And there is already some great examples of this where there are, there are green health networks developing in parts of Britain. Um, Scotland's actually ahead of England in this regard, um, where um, the real investment in, in getting people out and getting great health outcomes um, um, from people being involved in restoring nature and enjoying nature. Um, we do need to transform um, the finance sector. I even if we look at climate finance, only 3% also benefits nature. Um, we need to move the way we, um, we, need, we need nature to catch up with many of the initiatives that are already happening in the climate sphere. Um, so task force for nature-based um, dis disclosures where um, businesses and, and um, particularly big financial institutions will be encouraged to have far greater transparency of their impacts on nature and to offer nature-friendly investments. Green bonds, um, we can expect to see a growing feature of, um, of uh, investment um, opportunities in the future. Um, linked to this is the adoption of science-based targets for nature across sectors. And, um, and again, this is catching up with what's already happened in the carbon world. So becoming um, uh, nature positive begs the question of how. How would I know if I got there? How would I know which companies to buy from? Well, those, those are coming, um, uh, or at least the framework for it is coming. We need to drive the adoption of those sorts of um, approaches. And we need to embed the values of nature in decision making um, far more. Um, and some, again, some countries are ahead of game on this. The Welsh have a um, Future Generations Commissioner and a, and a Future Generations Act, which essentially means that any new laws being brought in and new policies and so on are tested against the impact on future generations. And thinking about how we um, embed values in the round, and I don't just mean um, monetary values, but, but holistic understanding of the values of nature in, in the way we make decisions. Is, is something that we need to do, we, we need to start doing. I'd say, go back to say better, we don't really do it at all yet. And, and ultimately this is around changing the rules by which society runs, which of course is terrifying, isn't it? Transformation is scary. Um, we've, we've developed these rules, but they are just rules. You know, we, we, we have a situation um, where um, um, many of the most societal damaging things that we can do are also the cheapest things to do. Uh, and those that's, that's created by um, taxation systems and incentives and so on that, that, that generate that, that approach to, to how we live our lives. We can change those rules. And, and I think this for me is really what the church is about. Um, you know, transformation is scary, but, but, but it's what we do. Um, the, you know, the church has led transformations before. Um, Fair trade would not be mainstream if it wasn't for what the church 
um, did in adopting it and leading it and driving it and running community groups and selling in, in churches and, and just getting people used to buying these things. Um, the church co-founded and provides ongoing support for the Transition Pathway Initiative. So that's now up to over $50 trillion of investments um, being um, directed at, um, at pathways that are um, consistent with achieving net zero. Um, and ultimately, saving nature and tackling climate, just, climate change is about equity and justice. I've been really struck by how equity um, and justice is, is very much the conversation in, um, in these international fora. It's, it's what people now talk about. And, and actually, that's what I remember Rowan Williams talking about 20 years ago. He, was, he, was, he said climate change was a justice issue. He mostly spoke about climate change. Now he talks a lot about um, ecological um, crises as well. But um, it was why um, when the um, uh, Christian Aid made, it, made its first forays into climate change science and climate change um, advice for, for people, that was all about justice. And it was how they, how they understood why they were getting involved. So, so we're ahead of the game here. And, um, and these conventions are catching up with what the church has already been thinking. Some concluding reflections, my last slide. Um, the need for action is urgent. And um, I, you know, when I speaking to um, Catherine just before starting, she said, you're gonna get everybody depressed, aren't you? And I said, well, I hope not, but we can at least go off and have a glass of wine if that's how you feel. I, I hope it isn't. Because um, I think there is a way through this. Um, but people are dying and species are becoming extinct. Local extinctions are happening in Nearly 50% nearly of species that have been assessed at global level, we can find local populations being lost because of climate change. So this is, this is already happening. And we know that worse is to come because we've locked in a lot of climate change and a lot of nature loss ahead of us. But we still can avoid the worst outcomes, provided we act fast. Um, there are adaptation and mitigation options that deliver multiple benefits for people and nature. And we need to take those, and roll them out as standard. They need to be the default way in which we, we, we act to, um, to, to, to change some of the land use that's, that's happening and the way we use our seas and so on. But avoiding catastrophic damage to people and nature will require transformational change. It's not just about protecting bits of land that are left or establishing some nature recovery networks. That doesn't work if we continue to have systems that fundamentally undermine those actions by by harming um, nature and by harming and by um, damaging the climate. There are some hard choices that we need to make as a society, um, and that's where I think the church can really have a strong voice and um, and and to shout out about that change and lead the way, because we do have the brief and rapidly closing window of opportunity. Let's take it. I shall stop sharing there. I hope I've left a bit of time for some questions. And I'm in your yeah. hands. Thank you, Pete. And we do have some, yeah, some quite fascinating and, and searching questions. I think the thing I wrote down as you were speaking was you said, this is not about protecting places. It's about changing society. I think that's what strikes me most from from what you said well, um, we need to do a bit of both but it, one isn't enough on its own the, the first question is from emma which is about rewilding um, rewilding is the best nature-based solution as a proportionate response to the crisis we're facing so it'd be interesting just to have your your kind of comment on on rewilding but then she goes on to say as historical stewards of land and people should the church be making bold targets for rewilding church commissioner land for example 50 percent or 30 percent of church commissioner land do give me your your perspective on rewilding and, and what the church should be doing in response so um i think rewilding means different things to different people um what i mean by rewilding is about um restoring um ecosystem processes as best we can and then um stepping back and and letting those processes work to um, to develop um, um, to allow nature to, to recover. Um, it can mean um, that can also mean in terms of restoring those ecosystem processes some 
pretty major interventions actually and in, uh, um, in, um, it, it could mean um, I, I don't know st stopping draining land or stopping stopping draining peat it could mean restoring some um, some seed beds if they've been really severely depleted and so on so it, it's not necessarily about doing nothing but it is working with nature and it's about working um, with ecosystem processes that works best at scale and it's it's quite sobering to think I was lucky enough recently to go to the Camargue where there is 13 a 13,000 hectare area of land under entirely beneficial ownership it's it's owned by a charity and um and and it's it's what you would call a strictly protected area in international terms there's very little humans of course go there people go there um they enjoy it but there's 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 no um substantive um activity uh, economic activity and so on it is not recovering as it should do because of what's happening around it R rice um, in particular, um, with with loads of pollutants, but with loads of nutrients and pesticides being applied, is undermining that land. So, scale really matters um, on this. So, while I I do think we should look at how church commissioner land could work to support nature recovery in nature recovery in, in, in the context of nature recovery networks. And that allows it potentially to keep doing what the church commissioners would like it to do, which is to earn money. And increasingly, and what I, I didn't, I was conscious of time, so I slightly backed away from it, but the, the government has committed to shifting our own agricultural subsidy payments from um, largely giving the money to farmers as part of production subsidy into paying for public goods. And that, that's still being implemented, but the signs are really positive. There are schemes coming out. And if we get it right, and it's still an if, I'm afraid, but if, if government goes through with it, it's really exciting. And that will give good money, <laughs> I would say, um, for doing great things for nature. And I think church, th th that's, a that's a good income stream and I think the church should look at it, but it needs to be done at the right scale. So that may need, if, if I, I mean, I'd love to see some land um, um, done, uh, you know, rewilded. What I know of the church commissioner land near me and glebe land near me is it's small patches often. So we would need to do that in a way that allows the scale to be established that enables rewilding to, to do what we'd like it to do. So yes, please. Um, and yes, we can get messier. All land can get messier. Messy is good, really good. It creates microclimates that allow species to persist, new ones to come in. Messy is great. Um, early successional habitats, good. Um, scrub, really great. But to, to really get into that rewilding space, we need, we need the scale. I will put in the chat um, the press release about the pack that church commissioners were part of, along with many of the other major landowners about managing land for climate and nature, because we heard earlier in the week about some really exciting work that's going on with the church commissioners in terms of how they manage their land for, for climate and nature. Uh, well, I've got another, there's some such interesting questions. I've got my eye on the clock as well. We'll have to be try and be fast. Um, Wendy asks, assuming this information is known across the board at the top of the church, all denominations, as well as financial business and other sectors, is it going to be fed down through the C of E hierarchy so that each individual parish can take action straight away? I'd have to say, why does it have to wait for that? Why does it have to wait, Wendy, for it to be... Yeah. To, individual parishes can take action now. Sorry, Pete, that was, you should be... No, I agree. Me. No, 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 I, th I, think, I think that's bang on. I, I, I you know... Actually, there needs to be this sandwich of um, or pincer movement of top down and bottom up action, because actually, you know, your space, you know, your land, you know, your partnerships are local, um, you know, your communities. Um, it's, I, the, the church will get it wrong if it tells you, tries to tell you exactly what to do. But I think it should provide the frame that supports what you've just said, Wendy. So I, I think it needs both. Yeah. And uh, and probably the biggest single thing we do in terms of outreach on, on this and on all the other issues is supporting the eco-church programme. And as you know, land is one, one of the sections of the eco-church programme and we encourage churches to sign up and, and take action using that framework to, to help them. Um, the question from Charles, I'm concerned about the UK government's current plans for biodiversity as reported in the Guardian here. 
Um, so I'm wondering about the merits of seeking legally binding targets for the UK government. What is your view? Should we should we have more legally binding targets? So this this is subject to a consultation. So I think if I know the I'm, <laughs> I don't really know URLs very well, but I think what that implies is that um, and I, I, I had it on my slide, but didn't didn't dwell on it. So forgive me. The baseline for that 2030 target is still being work, still being agreed. So it's possible because it's halt the loss of species abundance. That what you could say is, well, we'll have another eight years of decline and we'll bottom out by 2030. And I'll be candid. That's what some people are saying is is all that's possible. So they're saying, look, the rate of decline of you know moths for example declining two or three percent a year how are you going to turn that around you know you need really big changes in agricultural systems and so on so so you know that that is still quite challenging some would say but there is a um a current consultation about that uh, i personally um and natural england has been advocating that this is the baseline year so we should be down and back up at least where we are now by 2030 um and um the more people that say that would be, uh, you know, if, if we encourage the government to be ambitious, the more likely they are to commit to it. So um, I think it's still all to play for. But in a way, what matters is the resources that are mobilised around this and the change that comes through policies on the back of it. And I, I am encouraged by, I mean, for example, um, again, we're, we're all friends here. It's not being recorded or anything, is it? Okay, oh, it is. Um, but you know, at the moment, working on, um, I'm seeing ministers quite frequently to talk about, okay, how can you do this? Um, and it's really focused their mind, as I called, said earlier, it's their compass. And they're saying, will this help? How do we do it? How do we get there? So, and those are conversations that I've been longing to have for a long time. This target, even in its form, whatever it is, um, has made, made this center stage. And that's a good thing. Um, yeah, it'd be great to up the, up the ambition, but it's way better than what we had. No, no other country has this. It's, it's, it's better than most countries. Uh, the next question from Peter is about, um, uh, Anglican church land in other countries. So I'm aware that in less developed nations, churches' missions often own land and often in places where indigenous people live. I rarely hear stories of how this land is being used for conservation as distinct from development or income generation purposes. How does the Anglican church have a role to play in encouraging the local church to use their land for conservation? Maybe that's outside of your your scope. I don't know, Pete. Yeah, there, there may be others on this call who could answer that better. I um, certainly what I'm aware of is some fantastic examples of church, church land being the oasis with nature in it around um, you know, really depleted um, uh, other land and not just for other faith groups as well. Um, there are, I'm trying to remember the term. There are these faith forests or something. There, there's, there's, uh, there, it, th this has been looked at where, where people have looked at um, how um, different faith groups, but certainly Churchland is doing it. I think Ethiopia is a great example where there are some really good examples of, of that. So I, I think I think it's happening. Um, and actually, this this narrative um, isn't surprising to a, a lot of people in the world. You know, we're having to rediscover in 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 countries like the UK our relationship with nature and remind ourselves that we're part of nature. Uh, some of those people have never, never forgotten it and, um, and treasure it much more than we do um, and, and have a relationship. I mean, this is one of the issues with valuing nature. Some of these people are saying, well, that's ridiculous. That's like saying, how much do you want for my grandmother? Like, you know, you can't value, you can't put a price on those things. Um, and, um, and, and, and so, you know, actually, culturally, spiritually, they're ahead of us in many instances. Um, but but they're desperately poor and, um, and less able to do it. So yeah, we could learn from them as much as teach them. I'm conscious it's five o'clock. There's some really interesting questions. Pete, can I keep you for another five minutes or do you? Gladly, if people want to stay. I've... So you're so only That's keeping me from screaming kids, so it's great. <laughs> you don't have a five o'clock meeting on a Friday afternoon. I'm glad to hear. Um, question from Bernie and Gwen. I've been learning from reading about NEP 
and visiting farm aid in the Cotswolds that regenerative agriculture is important and changing the global food system away from large scale, single crop, heavy use of fertilizers, pesticides and long distance transport of food. Should we emphasize this in political campaigning and among farmers in rural communities? And actually that really links to the, to the next question as well about what can we be doing to pushing for policy changes for our, our tenant farmers as subsidized to, to, for nature recovery. So maybe we can take those two questions together about what do we do about yeah. farming? So I, I think um, there is a lot of interest in, is there enough land for food and, um, and nature and all the other things that we want to do uh, in, in this crowded country of ours. And I, um, um, farmers are very good at responding to the signals that society gives them. I, you know, I, I, I don't blame farmers for, for, for the situation that, um, that we, I mean, 71% of England is farmed. Or is that the UK figure? Anyway, over 70% of England certainly is farmed. And, um, and they're, they're, they're the key, um, they're, their relationship with the land will be key and we have encouraged them to have and paid them to have a, a relationship that's actually very harmful and unsustainable in the long term for food systems as well as for nature that needs to change and regenerative agriculture is, is a really exciting way of, of doing it I, the I've, I've been to a number of regenerative farms and um and these are profitable places um producing um um, you know, good amounts of food. This this isn't just a, a, a you know a, ri a rich person's hobby. The, these are places that are financially viable, um, far more so often than than um, uh, more intensive farms in in similar landscapes. And they 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 they're really they think they're producing. They tell me they're producing a lot of food. So and certainly that's the analysis that um, Henry Dimbleby led he's a restaurateur but he led a, he had a very good team provided to him and was asked to commit asked to carry out a review and produce something called national food strategy um, it's not a strategy yet the government will publish a national food strategy next week for England um, we believe um, but so so watch that one um, but certainly he was in a place of saying yes you, we can have this all we reduce we need to improve the efficiency of our food system and tackling waste is really important um, and we can farm differently and more sustainably and regenerative agriculture, our, our agroforestry and so on could be a really important part of that. Um, the, the second part of the question was around um, a policy change, was it? Um, or, uh, it was sorry. about, um, should the church be pushing for policy change so that their tenant farmers are subsidised for large scale nature recovery on their land, which is... So we don't need the policy change. Else? Yeah, the, the policy changes, it, changes are coming. We have um, uh, this new environmental land management scheme, as it's called, which has three different tiers. Uh, I think we need to have far more direct conversations with tenant farmers. I, I think that's improving. But I've had situations um, in my diocese and environmental officer role where tenant farmers have turned up, church tenant farmers, just to say, no, I just wanted to hear what the church was thinking about this because you, you own the land I farm and nobody ever tells me anything. And the contact is, is actually done through um, um, estate managers who, who are, you know, have a remit around, well, this is how we do farming and the job is to get income for the church commissioners. Their, their remit is typically not to get them into agri-environment schemes and to explore different ways of farming. And, and so I think there is a lot of scope for having a different conversation with tenants um, because some tenants may not think that we'd, we'd even want them to do it. They may think that we're our, we had an awful case um, in Peterborough where a tenant felt their job was to return their land to agricultural condition, um, which, which meant they cut down a whole load of fantastic scrub with nightingales in it and all the rest of it. And they thought they were doing what the church wanted. So the, we, we risk really perverse outcomes by not having a better relationship with, with our land for the church. And, um, and I, I, I don't think it's as it should be. So I think, I think the policies are coming. Uh, as I say, you know, fingers crossed. If um, the Secretary of State DEFRA's Secretary of State has indicated that um, the, the split of um, the agricultural, the, the total envelope of agricultural payments will remain the same, and it might be split across higher level schemes, which, um, 
which would be landscape change. So rewilding and some of the things that we've been talking about, big, big scale change and um, middle schemes, um, which are um, much more around uh, managing good habitat, ma managing habitats and creating hedgerows and so on. And then, and then more um, what's called sustainable farming um, initiative measures, which are, which are water course management and um, reducing pollution and so on. At the moment, that top tier doesn't exist that middle tier and that bottom tier get around four million pounds. If we get this, and that's out of a, of a whole pie of pie that's about 2.3 billion. If we split it a third, a third, a third, then that's potentially, you know, um, you know, one and a half billion going to measures that might be good for nature. That's profoundly exciting. So let keep pushing. If we can keep pushing and saying, this is what we want, this is how we want public money to be spent, um, then um, ministers may hold their nerve and keep it. Because of course, this is change for farmers and the NFU and others are saying, this change is too much. We need, we need to have it all in that, in that lower level. Um, so, so there's tension there. But, um, and I paraphrase, they're not, certainly not all saying that, um, but you know, this change is, is a big thing. And Ukraine has come along. People are worried about food security. That that push for food um, is is something, and cost of living, and so on. And if people think this is a way of having less food and more expensive food, then it's very hard to, for those things to land. So us saying, look, this matters, and there's a different way, and we stand behind it, is really important. So so um, yeah, let's, let's shout about it from the pulpits. And in terms of engagement with tenants i do encourage everyone to listen back to the webinar with the church commissioners on wednesday because they spoke a lot about tenant engagement and engagement with land agents it's clearly very important to them um, and they are so, working on it and i think that's new isn't it Catherine? i think that's that's a change so, so it's getting that. becoming an increasing focus of their work absolutely brilliant, brilliant. right we're going to have to try and be really really fast with two big questions i think Nigel's question is probably just needs a yes. Nigel says, is the greatest impact of the church not so much with our own land and buildings, but by generating conversations amongst our fellow citizens to get a popular enthusiasm for the transformative change that is needed? Does that just yes. need a wholehearted yes? Yes, entirely. But um, it's a yes and. I think we can't do the, we can't be credible in doing that if we if if we don't get our act in order. So um, so so I agree. I think I think that that will be the biggest change. But in order to achieve that, I think the first needs to happen a bit. And, and, and I've left Joama's question till last because I thought it so beautifully combined your your two hats, your scientist hat and your your church hat. Mm. Do we need a refreshing of our theology? Nature and animals are often seen as a bit pagan by Christians rather than all part of the family of the cosmic Christ. That, that's a slightly philosophical note to end on, but do you have Since Jemima's good at these sorts of questions, that, isn't she? I think it was, thank you, Jemima. Um, I, I'd like to think that theology exists, actually. Um, I, I think that um, creation care and so on is, is, is very much um, part of the church's lexicon, um, you know, fifth mark of commission, and so on. Um, I, I, so I hope we've moved beyond the place where I, I have no doubt that's where we once were. We were there about taming nature, weren't we? Um, that you know, cleaning up the countryside, cleaning up churchyards, so on. Um, and and, um, and I think I think we've moved beyond that already. I hope, but um, but we, we should never take it for granted. And um, and the the way in which we, um, you know, this one of the great things about the Eco Church program is the way it guides us to think about the worship, the teaching, and and so on. Um, because it's it's a really important part of this. This has to be based on faith because that's the only way change will happen. So I, th I think um, I, I I completely agree with you. We need to do it. I don't think we need. I think we don't have to look very hard to find. The, 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 the theological support for it. Brilliant. What a lovely note to end on. Um, you'll be glad to, to hear that somebody's put in the chat, uh, not, not depressing, realistic and, and mildly optimistic, still off for a glass of wine though. Excellent. <laughs> um, thank Great. you so much for your talk. I knew it would be an excellent one to end the week on and, and it really has. Your, your 
understanding of that big picture and the translation of it so that people can understand it, I think is, is second to none. So thank you so much. Thank you to everyone who's joined us today. And if you've been with us earlier in the week, thank you for coming on to our other sessions as well. I do hope that you found them informative and inspiring. Um, I, uh, Pete, if you're happy to send me thank over you. your slides, I'll send those I out to everybody with the links from the chat. The recordings will be on our website. Um, the first three days are up there already. Uh, Thursday and Friday will be up there early next week. Thank you so much for coming today and have a good weekend. And please, this weekend, go out in your local churchyard and record what you see using iNaturalist and send those records in. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye. Thanks, Catherine.